Yeah, everyone. Welcome to today's webinar on Forces of Art, a conversation with Zainab Virgi, laureate of the 2020 Governor General's Award in Visual and Media Arts for Outstanding Contribution. Thank you to the National Arts and Culture Portfolio for hosting us today. My name is Hasina, and I'll be moderating the conversation with Zainab. We will start by sharing with you a quick introduction about Zainab followed by a conversation which will briefly explore the following themes. Art and culture in time of a pandemic, how art fosters civil society, arts in cultural diplomacy, and collaborations in art, science, and technology. I met Zainab a few years ago when I used to work at the Ontario Arts Council, and I remember how excited she was when she realized that I was an Ismaili professional working in the arts and culture sector. Zainab was born in Nairobi, Kenya. She attended boarding school in the UK before moving to Vancouver in the early 1970s. She complete, while she was completing her degree in economics and business administration at Simon Fraser University, she took her electives in fine and performing arts through which she was introduced to video arts. Video arts was an emerging an innovative field which opened the door for many artists to enter the world of visual and media arts in the 70s. Today, Zainab is a known Canadian cultural administrator, art critic, arts advocate, art center and gallery director, and artist. She is currently the executive director of Galerie Ontario, Ontario Gallery's GOG. Her work has been shown in Canada and internationally, including at the New York's Museum of Modern Art, the Portland Institute of Contemporary Art, and the Venice Biennale. Her work, created by the Burnaby Art Gallery, was exhibited at the Smiley Center in Burnaby, and she was also the chair of the Aga Khan Council for Regional Arts and Culture Portfolio in BC in the early 90s. And more recently, as you may remember, the director of the inaugural International Art Gallery at the Diamond Jubilee Arts Festival in Lisbon in 2018. A few months ago, Zainab received the Governor General's Visual and Media Arts Award for Outstanding Contribution. The awards are, in a, are a peer assessed competition which recognized her contribution to the arts and shaping cultural policy in Canada. Zainab firmly believes that art is a public good and throughout her career has advocated on issues of diversity, access, technology, and artists' rights. Welcome, Zainab. We are very happy to have you with us today. Can you share with us some of your work currently displayed at the Art Gallery in Edmonton? Thank you, Hasina, for that wonderful introduction. Uh, I also want to thank the National Arts and Culture Portfolio uh, for inviting me uh, to do this today and have this conversation um, to Shala Ramji in Edmonton and, and also to the webinar team. So there are six works in the Governor General's Winners Exhibition and uh, what I'll do is I'll do a very brief overview of the work uh, and just sort of go through it and tell you a little bit about it. So the first work um, that I'll speak about is Through the Souls of My Mother's Feet. Uh, it's a four channel, eight monitor video installation. And it, as um, you mentioned, Hasina, it was curated by the Burnaby Art Gallery and the site of the exhibition was the Smiley um, Center in Burnaby, then the Durkana. And um, what this work does is actually, it traces the migration of our community from India to Africa and to the Western world. And initially uh, the working title was actually nomadic architecture because um, I wanted to look at architecture not to mean only built structures, but really um, how a community interacts with itself uh, and the larger social and natural worlds. Um, and this work is dedicated to my mother 
and the women in our community. Now, this piece that you see uh, is actually two pieces. Um, they're text-based and they're conceptual pieces on the wall. Uh, one refers to the Fluxus ethos, which doesn't see any separation between art, life, and work. Um, and the other one, the art is a public good, is a political statement actually on what art is and something I firmly believe in. Um, another really um, kind of really interesting piece um, in the exhibition, it's sort of a sculptural work made up of a book and, and an audio component. Um, this year actually marks the 70th anniversary of the Massey Levesque report. And this report is, is the central and controlling policy document which defines what is Canadian culture. It also defines the idea of Canadian content and actually for that matter, uh, who is a Canadian artist. But I think it's really important to note who is not in it and what is excluded in the institutionalization of art and culture in Canada. Uh, okay, the status of the artist um, is, the, is another piece and it actually opens the exhibition. It's at the very entrance of the gallery. So the first piece that people will see when they enter is actually this work, the status of the artist. It's in, um, it's in lead neon and it actually becomes the statement that centers the issues of precarious working conditions of the artist. So, um, so these are the six pieces in the exhibition um, at the AGA. Great, thank you, Zainab. This is a great transition to our first team of the webinar looking at art and culture in time of a pandemic. The year 2020 marked the 40th anniversary of the status of the artist, which is a declaration that was made at a, at a session in UNESCO, of the UNESCO, to place artists on an equal footing with other professionals in the labor market. Zainab, you've been very busy in 2020. You've done a lot of work uh, specifically to address this issue of labor of artists in society. In the viral op-ed in the Georgia Strait published in May 2020, you, you wrote about the COVID-19 crisis and, and how it has exposed hypocrisy about artists and their labor and the many gaps that came back to the surface when addressing the labor force in the arts and what constituted their income. In July 2020, you co-authored an open letter to the Prime Minister addressed to the Prime Minister of Canada from the arts community representing over 75,000 artists, calling on the federal government to create a system of basic income for artists and cultural workers in Canada. The goal of this basic income guarantee is to provide financial security to meet people's basic needs and allow them to participate in society, living with dignity regardless of their work status. You've also participated in 13 interviews in a national media campaign across Canada on the topic of Artists for Basic Income Guarantee. Can you explain to us what the status of the artist means today at a time of a pandemic and why has artist labor issues come back to the forefront of national and international discussions in 2020? Yeah, um, you're right. So during the COVID um, crisis, I have been writing on these issues um, that matter to the arts and really especially from that policy and systemic perspective. Um, on May 15th, I did write on this 40-year-old issue um, in the Georgia Strait, as you can see from the screenshot, um, the slide. But you, you may ask, what is the status of the artist? Now, it is a UNESCO declaration that was made in 1980, to which Canada is a signatory, and it addresses the social and economic status of the artist. There are two things primarily that this covers. One is the centrality of artists in society. And two, and really importantly, the atypical nature of work that artists do, and hence the issue of income that's associated with it. And these really are the core tenets of the status of the artist, which informs 
the governance of any legislation pertaining to artists' labor and their income. Um, so let's see what the status of the artist is today. In fact, today, the world of labor looks a lot like the way art labor has looked for decades. Um, you know, and you know that artists um, earn 43% less than general labor. Uh, the status of the artist declaration asked the signatory governments to offer artists equal status and footing with other professionals in the labor market. And in Canada, artists have exp experienced actually similar exclusions uh, as farm workers, as migrant workers, and even domestic workers in the labor law. So um, the next um, theme that I, I sort of want to really speak to um, is, is this uh, civil society um, uh, theme. And, and um, because it is one of the things that I felt was really important uh, in addressing this, so, in this conversation. Yeah, that, that's very exciting. So our, our imam encourages, encourages us to live within the values of our faith, fostering and upholding values of pluralism and strengthening civil society to improve the quality of, to improve our quality of life and the quality of life of the people amongst whom we live. How does art and artists play a role in f fostering civil society? Yeah, I mean, I think we have to ask, you know, what is civil society? Um, but currently we're in a very unique historical situation, I'd say, and we're facing four crises. One is the pandemic, the health crises. Uh, the other is social, where we're looking at the inequalities coming to the forefront, and obviously the economic. And now the fourth one also is, is the climate crisis that we are undergoing. Um, what, how can we understand what civil society means and its interaction with these crises? And what is the role of art and artists in it? Um, civil society actually is the arena that is outside of the state and government, outside of family, and even outside of the market. It's the place where people voluntarily associate to advance the common interest based on civility. And generally understood, you know, these are the seven norms on which civil society works or functions for the commons. And through the next few slides, what I'm going to, what we'll see is um, how art and civil society are deeply interlinked. Arts has one of the most central roles actually in fostering civil society. And the arts are a touchstone for wider philosophical narratives of freedom. Art, culture, and philosophical ideas, they're not luxuries, they're not adjunct, they're not something on the side, but they're absolutely essential ingredients in creating the ecosystem of free expression, intellectual engagement, and challenge, which contributes to change and fulfillment in a pluralistic and democratic society. My conviction that art is a public good offers the most relevant vehicle for my practice of pluralism and its critical import. Um, actually, pluralism has been part of the art discourse at least since the late 60s. And between the 70s and 80s, it became central as the world saw very significant changes. Um, pluralism to me means reconciling what is unique in our individual traditions with a profound sense of what connects us to all of humankind. And this manifests in two key concepts, critical responsiveness and self-assertion. And this allows to extend the idea of the agency of an individual as a social subject across the socio-political domain and wherein the political is constantly redefined and resignified. So let, let me show how this actually functions. Um, Hasina, you already spoke about this, but in the campaign for basic income, what we actually see is artists coming together for the common good. 
In the earlier slide on the status of the artist, we see the issues of artists' labor, increased marginalization, poverty, loss of dignity. And for an artist, their work and practice is lifelong. It is a life of emotional labor, decommodified labor, and it's atypical labor. So artists now are saying, well, we've lost our agency. What can we do and how do we regain it? And it is actually, it's this question that has brought together artists in a growing movement across the world, but especially in Canada on basic income. And as you said, I was the co-author of the public letter written to the prime minister representing uh, over 75,000 artists demanding basic income because we firmly believe that a basic income guarantee is a way out of the crisis that we've mentioned earlier and the one that we're facing. It will give artists back their dignity. So you can see that's really important. Um, I also you know, mentioned the four crises. So let, let me focus on climate change for a couple of minutes and, and let's see how artists are engaging with this uh, area, with the area of climate change. What you see on this slide, it's a work at the Tate Modern in London, England, called Ice Watch. And Olafur Ellison and the geologist Minik Rosing um, did a project aiming to bring the effects of climate change a bit closer to home. Uh, we think the issue on um, melting icebergs is really distant, right? It's not, it's not near us, it's far away, it's up north. And so what this artist decided to do is bring it home literally. And as the artist says, put your hands on the ice, listen to it, smell it, and look at it, and witness the ecological changes our world is undergoing. So you can see how far, how powerful the, the thought behind this work is where the ice is actually being brought to you and you're being called upon to actually engage with the ice, to, to make it more real. Um, another artwork, Refugees, actually is a sculpture by Gulzar Contino, an Ismaili artist, um, and this work was shown at the International Art Gallery at the Portugal, Portugal Pavilion in Lisbon. And uh, Gulzar's sculpture brings the refugee crisis front and center because it is directly connected to climate change. Now in this work, um, this, this is a really famous work. It's Ilya Kabakov's work. Um, it was called A Toilet. It was shown at Documenta, which is you know an international prestigious art fair, which tells two tales and it relating two points of the project's origin, um, the autobiographical and the art historical. And, Basically, he's referring to the past and the future of Soviet society while reflecting upon the moment, um, the end of history as the end of Cold War was called. Um, so really important work again. And, and, um, and I've worked in the area of water and so I really wanted to kind of bring up things that are related with this. Um, between 2007 and 2014, I worked intensely with the whole area of water, uh, both from an academic um, and an art perspective, as well as the socio-political histories of it and policy-related work um, in its governance, uh, international governance, etc. And I was actually really fortunate to meet and spend substantial time with the Stockholm Water Prize laureate like Tony Allen and also Bindeshwari Patak, and, and others, but in this period, I think there were three more significant people that shaped my thinking on, on water. Uh, uh, Eric Singh Do, uh, Helen Ingram, and Matthew Gandhi. Um, and it was that book, and um, I had the privilege to actually review the book, uh, uh, Water, Place, and Equity for MIT's Leonardo Journal. And, um, this book highlights the importance of equity in water policy and it explores its co uh, complexities and all different aspects about it. 
Um, I also spoke at a conference um, called Contingent, uh, Contingent Ecologies at the Subtle Technologies um, on, on a city in a glass of water where I really focus on what happens during the urbanization of water. So my interests as an artist are in the flows of water which are simultaneously physical and social and they carry in their currents the embodiment of a myriad of social struggles and conflicts. Um, so, you know, water is really, really important actually in, in this um, uh, and for artists and how they engage with this. Yeah. This is a wonderful. Uh, thank you so much, Zainab. You keep bringing on really amazing examples. Now let's switch to another exciting topic. Let's talk about art and food. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so I want to show, um, I want to spend a little bit of time here as well, because I think it's really important. Um, what you see here is the image of the Nimma Nama uh, circa 15. It's a medieval Indian cookbook, and it was written in the Persian language using the Naqsh, uh, Nashk script, uh, and it really talks of delicacies and recipes, and there's some beautiful accompanying paintings illustrating the preparation of recipes. Um, and here are some other folios that you may have come across at leading museums. Um, this one is from the Indian National Museum. And these folios, as you can see, are really quite beautiful with a lot of detail. Uh, and they're all about feasting and food. And um, I wanted to juxtapose and continue here that there are similar works from our times dealing with food and cooking. And I think the question that we need to ask is in what ways does recipe writing represent self and community? You know, uh, food boundaries seem to be seem to be dissolving actually much more rapidly than marriage boundaries, um, because eating permits a variety of registers, and it's tied to particular contexts. So, what is done in a restaurant may be really different from what is seen as appropriate at home, and each of these might be very different kinds of compartmentalization. But let me share some thoughts on reading of food as a communal and collective practice. It's the social interaction such as this that characterizes where women uh, or jamaat verbally or through a cooked dish exchange recipes with one another across various geographical and temporal boundaries. It's the oral exchange of recipes, um, you know, from the technical point of view, it, it's um, the elementary process that underlies the production of these cookbooks, right? It's like you talk about recipes and then, you know, these recipes finally found themselves into these cookbooks. Now, these are cookbooks which I'm sure many of you would find uh, familiar and can be found almost in many Ismaili families, especially those from East Africa. I think um, discussing a cookbook more generally, one can explain that self-conscious or not, recording every act of cooking is an act of autobiographical writing and self-representation. Culinary practices are a tool of recreating selfhood. Recipe writing plays out nostalgia for the past where everyday life and freedom prevailed, allowing the displaced or the uprooted self to relive normality. And these memories are prompted by the recuperation of the culinary practices that are often only unique to women. And I think that this is really important and critical work which has actually been overlooked because they played one of the most important roles in the settlement of our Jamaat. And um, though we use these works, I think we as a Jamaat have to recognize the work of these women. You know, it's really important to do this, who through culinary practices, you know, fostered our collective Jamaati identity. And I think, you know, we need to give 
um, than the due place in our col in our cultural history um, that reflects the contemporary times. So there's, you know, Nurunimji's work and there's um, uh, the Umedali's work and there's so many other other pieces, right? Uh, and books that have been written that we are familiar with in the contemporary time in our own in our own kitchens. Uh, and so I think we need to recognize this work. This is thanks. This is very, very exciting. I actually have a story to share with you. Um, I, I also grew up with Nurbani Nimji's books. Actually, when, when we were in high school, my mom was involved with the Alliance Francaise in Johannesburg in South Africa. And she would be giving cooking classes to the French community there, teaching them about our spices, our history, our culture, which is really proud of. And so she would take the ladies to Fordsburg, which is an er area larger than Girard Street in Toronto, to buy spices, Indian vegetables and meat. And then my sister and I were in charge of typing and printing the recipes for the ladies. And after their, their lesson, they would uh, gather and eat together. And so many exchanges happened this way through this act, cultural act of cooking and interacting together. Zeno, how are artists engaged with food? Well, that's such a great story to have shared with us. Um, and I think we all have one, right? We we can all, I'm sure we all have a story uh, with one of with these books in some way or the other. Um, yeah, so artists obviously um, have like, you know, like water and like some of the other things that we already talked about, um, have also worked with food. And this is very much um, what you see in this image is uh, Glenn Lewis's work. Um, and what you're seeing are images from his kimchi performances. And now, you know, kimchi um, is the Korean, you know, um, kimchi is a Korean condiment. And, and it's really unique because their recipes are traced back to more than 300 years. And they exist in their families. And they're passed on from one generation to generation. And what you see here is... Um, Glenn um, making kimchi and he speaks about actually the politics of food and this is very much part of sort of the fluxus um, relational aesthetics work kind of work that's done. Um, another one that I want to talk about is in this work uh, by Rikrit uh, Trivajanija and what we see here is that there's a meal, a meal being served in the gallery premises. Um, what he did was he served curry to visitors at New York's 303 Gallery. Um, and it was kind of a work of participatory performance art. Um, it's really kind of this free, free wheeling form of performance, you know, known as relational, known as relational aesthetics. And um, actually this piece, um, has been incorporated into the permanent collection of the Museum of Modern Art, uh, where where this work was re uh, recently restaged. Um, but let's move on to another theme related to food, um, and that's the the cultural diplomacy. Um, you can see that historically food has very much been part of diplomacy. Now, I love this image. It's <laughs> it's really quite wonderful. And it, you know, continuing um, the food connection here, you can see how food was formed um, as part of the gift giving culture and laid the rules for diplomatic etiquette. And what you see here is actually the Mughal Emperor Hamayan's meeting with um, Shah um, Tamash of Iran in, in 1554. Um, and I, I just, you know, this is like historical, but I can tell you even today, the table is where really important diplomacy work get, takes place. Um, that's where really the big conversations and the important ideas take place. Um, so, I don't sort of want to offer an exhaustive or very representative thing here, but I um, I wanted to kind of sketch out some art historical background to this relationship of the and and in which the garden is really important. Um, artists have always been deeply connected to gardens. Um, 
also the gardeners are really important artists um, and I wanted to just show some recent work here this is um, it's a it's a twin replanting of a medicine and butterfly garden by the late Micmac artist Mike McDonald um, who passed away in 2006 and it was undertaken at two sites within the Hall Demand um, and it was um, hosted by the Kishno Water Lou Art Gallery in the Woodland Cultural Center. And this is where uh, Mike McDonald's garden was first planted. Um, and this work was curated recently by Re Lisa Myers. And um, I just want to say that gardens are also this really important site for cultural diplomacy. Um, and it's a place where intellectual, intellectual engagement occurs. It's where bridges get built. Um, and this is a much longer conversation, which which I really hope to be able to speak about at a later date. But I do want to just say that you know these these are really important sites for cultural diplomacy, um, as well. I'm very curious about the images that you've shared with us here. What, can you tell us about what the ceremony is about and? What is the significance of this award for arts advocacy? Um, yeah, this is um, actually a Governor General's art ceremony at Rideau Hall in 2017. And in it, um, in this image, what you see is I'm presenting Glenn Lewis, whose kimchi work I showed earlier. Uh, he was the laureate um, this year as an artist, um, and I'm presenting him to the Right Honorable David Johnston. Um, you know, awards of excellence are really critical institutions of cultural diplomacy. Um, and you, there are many awards that we, we can see this in. The Al Khan Award for Architecture is, is such an award. And so I th um, wanted to show this because we, we wonder, you know, what is the role of, of this? And in this case, it's an arts award, which is really important. Okay. Um, so I'm going to just move on here. This poster is also um, in the exhibition at the Art um, Gallery of Alberta, and it's a poster about invisible colors, which was um, a, which is a critically acclaimed and well documented festival um, that was a precursor to a series of events in the 1990s. I was a co-founder and a co-director of this festival. I just want to note um, that it's been observed, and I'll quote, Invisible Colors remains one of the foundational film events in Canada, and its history is critical to our conversations today as we continue to struggle with post-colonial aesthetics, identity politics, and power. Um, the festival saw over 100 films and videos um, from 28 countries, and it emerged amid um, really contestations on nation building and the making of a global. Um, this was really about um, third cinema and the cinema of third world nations. Um, and third cinema was really Sort of came up, it was propped up as an alternative to cinemas of the first and second worlds, in which obviously we know Hollywood, um, but as well as um, Soviet cinema, for example. And what they did was it brought women filmmakers to one platform to define third cinema. And I think it's really important to note that um, the defining aspect that it was for women and it brought women together onto this one platform influencing national cinemas as well as third cinema because in the long kind of process and history of the institutionalization of third cinema it, it began with this committee um, that came together in 1973 in Algiers and then later in Buenos Aires and and during its history it's primarily been men until Invisible Colors occurred in Vancouver it was the first time in the history of third world cinema where all women were brought together under one umbrella. And that is really significant. And I, I guess thus um, we could say that Invisible Colors kind of etched three uh, defining markers. It foregrounded the histories um, 
of the struggle of women of color and third world filmmakers. Secondly, it brought forth the issue of race to, second, to the second wave of feminism. And third, it created a new alignment in the emergent global politics of third cinema. And, and this was part of the birth of the sort of whole feminist international relations movement as well. So really important, um, a really important event. Um, and I'm really glad that I was able to show the poster um, from it at the exhibition in, in Alberta. Um, so carrying on with the cultural sort of diplomacy theme, what you see here are two images. Um, one is the Senate report on cultural diplomacy, and the, th and the second image is um, an image from my forthcoming book. And recently in a journal article, I wrote um, offering an outline of the problem of the absence of um, art, science, and technology collaborations in the domain of international relations. Um, in the 21st century, the study of international relations has been impacted by multiple intellectual interventions as they, inter as they intersect in defining the contestation of the state-centric dominant anchoring of the discipline and its practice. And the current paradigm of neoliberal and neorealist schools of thoughts have focused really on the centrality of the nation state in defining the international order, which is articulated always in terms of war and peace. Now, given the urgency of understanding today's global politics of culture, the irony has not escaped one's eyes in the failure of international relations to integrate contemporary conceptions of art and culture and its histories into it. And so there's this challenge um, to contemporary study of international relations um, studies in, in the emergence of a new cohort in the International Studies Association in the United States, in, in the United States, which focuses on science, technology, art, and international relations. So the new an ac acronym is STAIR, S-T-A-I-R. And it's, you know, much like the Art and Politics Group in the British International Studies Association, VISA. So despite the growing insertion of cultural identity and art as an issue areas in the study of inter international relations, art institutions, exhibition making, art movements, artist networks, art events, and festivals are some of the most understudied areas in the study of uh, international relations. Um, but I'd say that with the rise of constructivism in international relations, there's a newfound appetite for bringing into its fold these very actors and their agencies that enables to open up these new areas of study, as well as foster the strengthening of a discipline of the 21st century. It's a really important part of um, the cultural diplomacy uh, work. I'm, I'm really happy that you're speaking to us about the concept of STAIR, science, technology, arts, and international relations, as this brings us to our last theme of the webinar on the collaborations between art, science, and technology. How do these collaborations happen and why are they important to society in society? Thank you. Um, thanks, Asina. I'm, I'm really glad that you've uh, introduced the theme of art, science and technology. Um, I guess when one generally talks about such collaborations, we, we kind of think of the digital age, right? Uh, but on the contrary, actually, uh, in Islamic up culture, there's been a long tradition of these exam of these collaborations, and um, this is a really good example. This elephant clock. Um, it's actually a folio from a um, a book of the knowledge of ingenious mechanical devices by Al Jazari, um, and actually talking of device art, here's another one I want to show. This is the um, one watt transistor. 
Um, and you can see in the image there, I'm actually making one. Um, and there's images to the right, uh, also where the pieces are laid out in this very kind of performative way. Um, but throughout its history, despite efforts by the futurists in the 1920s, um, radio has been considered largely a means of communication rather than an art form. And so therefore it's sort of ironic that just as traditional forms of radio are in decline, its possibilities as an art form are not, are actually reaching these sort of extreme potentials. And the birth of this sort of mini FM transmitter um, is related to a peculiar, peculiar situation of radio in Japan, where the purpose was not really uh, broadcasting, but it was narrow casting. And so this um, little transmitter could actually narrow cast up to a kilometer away. And it was used in a very specific way and becomes part of um, art, the art language, within art language as well. Um, yeah, and so now what I'm showing is this culture map. Um, because talking about this collaboration between art, science, and technology, I think you know one has to understand that it's a really vast topic. It has a really rich history. Uh, and um, when I was working at the Canada Council, we commissioned this project um, to map this for Canada, uh, digital culture in Canada. And we came out with this map. Um, it, it's hard to enlarge it here, but um, basically what it looks at is, you know, it looks at the relationship with the international scene. It looks at what is the access for art research and industry. It looks at presentation and exhibition networks. Um, it looks at kind of waves of innovation. It identified gaps in the system. And it also looked at, um, you know, how what the strengthening of the field for digital culture could be and where it was needed and what the funding issues were. So really overarching policy on culture and technology, um, it, it's needed and arts policy really has a large role to play in this relationship between culture and technology and is actually fundamental to understanding what digital culture is. So yeah, an important piece of work that was done trying to map out this kind of history of art, um, science, and technology. I think that given the context of this relationship between culture and technology, I think the question posed is, how does this relationship work? And what you see um, in front of you uh, actually is this paradigm and a trajectory of certain set of technological options that were available to artists. And I'm really talking about, let's say, the last 50 years or so, right, 50 odd years. And what you see is this sort of various phases which defined the material um, and the, the materials and the interface for artists to work with these materials. Um, and in the image to the right, what you can see is a really important work um, of Nancy Nisbet. It's really her work on surveillance. And if you look, uh, between um, the thumb and the index finger, you can see that there's chips embedded there, which she had implanted uh, in her own hands. And it was really to, to do this work on surveillance and she, she crossed borders and collecting data, etc. cetera. So um, you can see really interesting kind of work going on there. Um, um, here, I think it's, I wanted to really speak to this because it's really important. Um, what you see here is a is an image um, from of Ryan, which is um, an Oscar-winning animated short uh, that Chris Landreth made, and it's based on the life of Ryan Larkin, a Canadian animator who produced some of the most influential animated films of his time, and was also um, nominated for the Oscars during his time. There's a link that's been given there. We, we don't have time to do it to, to hear on this conversation, but if you all get a moment, I would really suggest having a look at it um, because it's really significant because this collaboration between the artist, scientist, and technologist led to a new technological innovation 
for musculoskeletal technologies, really important kind of collaboration that occurred. The beautiful artwork led to something, led to new innovation um, and, and will be, you know, um, really important for future that we understand these collaborations. Then on the right is, um, you, you see an image of Euphoria and Dystopia. This is a, a really important book which documents the history and role of um, the Banff New Media Institute, um, because the Banff Centre and the Banff New Media Institute really tried to build um, a wider, uh, more global, disciplinary, inclusive base and set of theories for this notions of new media and its history. And this, and my work is actually documented and part of these histories. Yeah. This is very impressive. What are your final thoughts uh, on the forces of art? Like, what is the takeaway for our viewers today? Yeah, thank you. Um, I hope that through this conversation, um, we can see how art artists are not operating in silos, but they're very connected to everything that's going on in the world. Um, but artists are really central and core to what we all enjoy. Um, and what I, I was really hoping that we could see in the conversation, the centrality of arts in society, um, and that artists are the bottom line. You know, we enjoy going to see artworks and listening to music and um, we are go, go to the theater. Um, and it's great to be engaged in the arts, but it's really important to remember the artists because without the artist, none of this would be happening. Artists play a very important role in society and it's really important to remember to support the artist. And I think that I really feel that um, next time you, you know, think about um, listening to music or you watch film or you're engaged in any of the issues that you're passionate about in society, whether it's climate change, the environment, you know, whether you are stewards of the land, remember the artist is connected to this very deeply. Yeah. So, um, I think that's why, you know, I would like to kind of hope that everybody's got a sense of, of this role of the artist. Thank you. Thanks, Zainab. Make sure to see the exhibition at the Art Gallery of Alberta. There's a vir virtual tour available online. Zainab's work will also be shown in Vancouver from June to August 2021 at C Center A, Vancouver International Center for Contemporary Asian art. Her other current and forthcoming exhibitions are art in the, art in the pandemic, which will be displayed at the Royal, Royal Canadian Academy of Arts in Ottawa, and hiding in plain sight at the Embassy, Embassy Cultural House. Thank you, Zainab, for taking the time in your very very busy schedule to share with us some of your knowledge and voice on the forces of art. Thank you to our viewers. We hope that you've enjoyed this session and that you've learned a little bit more today on the role of art as a pu public good and the importance of arts in society. Thank you and Yani Madat. Thank you. Thank you, Yani Madat.